Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name, my name is... Anyway, today we're going to continue our series that looks at various Star Wars ships and analyzes what their roles and functions are. So far we've covered Imperial Starfighters and Rebel Starfighters and Capital Ships. Today we're going to be moving on to the mighty Imperial Fleet and their larger ships as well. The Imperial Navy faces one of the most challenging tasks in human history. They've won control over a huge portion of the known galaxy. Their territory expands across millions of systems with even more inhabited planets and moons. Put into perspective, that massive Imperial Fleet all of a sudden doesn't look all that big. As we mentioned in our previous videos explaining Imperial Starfighters, the TIE in space superiority fighter primarily was designed for a peacekeeping role, which meant fighting off pirates and tracking down smugglers. These were cost efficient ships that lacked hyperdrive shields and life support. This meant without a carrier, they were more or less stuck. And not every system warranted the attention of one of the Empire's prized star destroyers or even a light cruiser. This is where the Quasar Fire class cruiser carrier came into play. Manufactured by Solar Space Asura Sub Corporations, it was actually a really odd choice for the Empire to select for a subcontractor role. For one, the Empire was generally anti-alien, woohoo! So it was strange for them to hire a Solston company. And two, Sora Sub wasn't really known for designing large military vessels. As a result, the Quasar fire was disappointing to say the least. They were lightly armed with just two turbo laser batteries and heavily depended on their fighters for protection. At 340 meters long, the Quasar class was surprisingly small for an Imperial carrier and could only hold around 48 TIE fighters. Now this could have been an attempt by the Imperial ship designers to save money on production and manpower, which is why the Quasar fire was usually deployed to remote systems, oftentimes without so much as an escort fleet or even a few gunships. This is also why the Quasar fire class cruiser was commonly hijacked and stolen by rebel cells. The Quasar Fire class cruiser carrier was also known for having some structural integrity issues, which really started showing up after repeated hyperspace travel. The Gazanti class cruiser was oftentimes seen in remote areas of the galaxy. It was much smaller than the Quasar Fire class cruiser at just around 64 meters. This extremely modular starship was a solution for many of the Empire's problems. Which isn't surprising because the Gazanti class cruiser is a product of the Corellian Engineering Corporation, who are experts in designing ugly, bulky looking freighters that could pretty much be modded to do anything and were deceivingly well designed. The base Gazanti class cruiser was equipped with two laser turrets along with docking ports for four TIE fighters. They could also carry a squad of stormtroopers. This meant that the Gazanti could handle interdiction or small ground missions that the Empire would commonly face in the Outer Rim. While they could usually hold their own in confrontations, a determined and well-armed wing of rebel fighters could make quick work of a Gazanti class cruiser. But for the most part, the Gazanti class cruiser did a good job patrolling the outer rim at a very reasonable cost. The cruiser could also be modified as an assault carrier for mechanized ground operations. The small ship could carry up to two AT-ATs or four ATSTs, which greatly increased the range of the slow walkers. The ship was also the perfect size to be used for intelligence gathering missions. The IGV-55 surveillance vessel was a heavily modified Gazanti class cruiser that was equipped with various sensors and transmitters and was used to intercept and jam communications. When a heavy rebel presence was detected in the Outer Rim, small fleets were usually organized under the command of an Arcadence class light cruiser. These 325 meter long ships proved to be a huge headache for early rebel fleets. Armed with four turbo lasers, eight laser batteries, multiple concussion missile launchers, and tractor beams, these sleek light cruisers were extremely dangerous and fast enough to keep up with even the fastest rebel blockade runners. These ships usually led multiple Gazanti class cruisers and Quasar class carriers into battle and caused so many headaches for the rebellion that it was rumored the B-Wing project was started primarily to fit large enough weapons onto a snub fighter to counter these ships. Although these ships have been used by the Republic since the Clone Wars, the Imperial version included a command section which also featured extra escape pods for the bridge crew. This ship could also carry a small complement of fighters on board as well. 
The rediscovery of gravity well generators by Imperial scientists quickly led to the development of a new type of ship, the Interdictor. Now, all ships travel on predetermined set hyperspace lanes that are scouted and cleared of debris. However, in the case some rogue asteroid or space station suddenly appears in the corridors of a hyperspace lane, all ships have gravitational detection safeguards aboard their ships that will quickly pull out their vessel from hyperspace if some kind of obstacle is detected in front of them. Imperial scientists realized that they could use artificial gravity wells to also pull ships out of hyperspace. The interdictors could give the Empire complete control of hyperspace lanes, and better yet, when the gravity well was activated, ships also couldn't jump into hyperspace. And as we know, the Rebellion relied on hyperdrives to survive because they were constantly running away from the Empire's massive fleet. This weapon would become a game changer. The first interdictor prototypes were placed in relatively small cruisers. Imperial shipbuilders eventually realized that due to the gravity well generator's massive power consumption, they needed something closer in size to a Star Destroyer to create a fully functional interdiction weapon, which led to the development of the Interdictor Class Star Destroyer. The Interdictor Class would be widely feared by the Rebellion. The sight of this ship in your system usually meant the end was near. Despite its feared reputation, the majority of the interdictor's power went into its gravity well, which meant that it lacked heavy firepower and shielding and was quite vulnerable to enemy fire and needed to be protected by a massive escort fleet. Now we're in the class of Star Destroyer, there's a lot of variants that we can talk about. Depending on who you ask, the Imperial Star Destroyers either came from the Venator class Star Destroyer design from the Republic era, or perhaps were influenced by early Sith wedge designs like the Harrower class Star Destroyer. Either way, they were sleek looking killing machines that were usually armed to the teeth and designed to put fear in the hearts of your enemy. The Onager class Star Destroyer, named after the medieval era siege weapon, was designed for a similar purpose as these early rock throwers, taking down enemy defenses. Unlike most Star Destroyers, at the front of this ship was a giant T-shaped structure that held two super heavy composite beam turbo lasers. This main weapon was capable of shattering giant mountains and even breaking through planetary shields. It was considered a super weapon by the Rebel Alliance and it was powered by a giant kyber crystal. As a matter of fact, Rebel spies earlier on in the war mistaken the project codenamed Siegebreaker for the Death Star. The First Order Manator IV class Siege Dreadnought's main weapon technology was also based on this earlier design. When an individual mentions a Star Destroyer, they're most likely talking about the Imperial class Star Destroyer. Not only was it the most common Star Destroyer to be deployed by the Empire, it also happened to be vital to the Imperial war effort. Individuals like Wilhuff Tarkin and Emperor Palpatine understood that the Empire lacked the necessary resources to patrol all of their territory. An authoritarian government only works when the gun being held to the people's head is always visible. So instead, the Empire adopted the highly flawed Tarkin Doctrine. It was an attempt to scare the galaxy into compliance. This meant building a military force that was both awe-inspiring and also terrifying. The consequences for disobeying the Empire had to be extremely costly, and oftentimes the appearance of the one-mile-long Imperial-class Star Destroyer over a city was more than enough to persuade rebels to give up. Just like the AT-AT, Stormtrooper helmets, and many other parts of the Imperial military machine, the Star Destroyer was designed to strike fear in the hearts of the enemies of the Empire. But aside from just looking terrifying, the Star Destroyer was much more than even just a ship of the line. For the 10,000 Stormtroopers on board, it also served as a mobile forward operations base. It was complete with the type of amenities you might find on a space station or even a landside base, including barracks, cantinas, entertainment, medical facilities, exercise facilities. It basically took care of every need a soldier could possibly have. The Imperial class also carried several shuttles, a vehicle pool made up of AT-ATs, ATSTs, speeder bikes, transports, artillery, not to mention a few wings of TIE fighters and bombers. And if things really got bad, Imperial commanders could always pull the Star Destroyer into close orbit and start bombarding with turbo lasers. The Star Destroyer was a self-contained battle unit that operated at a division level, which was sort of a perfect solution to the massive challenge of policing the galaxy. With a Class II hyperdrive, the Imperial class could cover massive amounts of distance within a day, and just one of these imposing ships could stabilize several systems at once. And due to its impressive armament and shielding, these gigantic ships were oftentimes deployed without any supporting escort ships. In large fleet engagements, multiple Star Destroyers usually formed the main line of, of battle formation and were used to pummel enemy capital ships in the same way battleships were used here on Earth in naval combat. Due to the triangle-tiered structure of a Star Destroyer, 
The majority of turbo lasers on the top deck of the Imperial class could fire unobstructed, amounting to a terrifying amount of outgoing firepower. Lastly, we have the Super Star Dreadnought, otherwise known as the Super Star Destroyer. In total, the Empire was rumored to have around a dozen of these massive ships, each of them longer than 10 miles, which in metric is around 500 meters, give or take 700 liters. These were more like giant cities rather than just ships. They usually housed over a quarter million people and had integrated transit systems to allow crew members to move around inside. While there were some specially designed dreadnoughts like the Emperor's Eclipse, the majority of the Superstar Destroyers were a part of the Executor class. These ships were incredibly demoralizing for the enemy to see. Roughly the size of Manhattan, a rebel pilot in a snub fighter probably wouldn't even know where to begin an attack run. The only time you really saw these enormous ships, though, were in core world defense fleets or at the head of large Imperial attack fleets, usually made up of dozens of Imperial-class Star Destroyers. Given the massive size of these dreadnoughts, they weren't exactly the most maneuverable ships and functioned more like space stations during battles. Star Destroyers would be deployed to protect vulnerable areas of these massive ships, like around the thrusters or engines, while dozens of wings of fighters would prevent any smaller ship from getting close. A dreadnought in the Executor class could easily take on dozens of capital ships all by themselves. Well, there you go. That is our analysis of the Imperial Navy. As you can see, the smaller ships in the Imperial Navy were kind of more designed to be cost efficient, and they were pretty much appropriate for the threats you might see in an outer rim planet like Lothal or Tatooine. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you have these massive star dreadnoughts, which were not cost efficient, but built for intimidation and also just psychological warfare. Anyway, if you enjoyed this episode, guys, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of the series. We will be looking at different factions from just the Galactic Civil War period, and we'll also be looking at other types of vehicles. Anyway, guys, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.